it's an altar to the devil. No, it, it really is beautiful. Welcome to Devil's Domain tonight. We've got a review for a release from Vinegar Syndrome. This is a Blu-ray uh, and it's never been released on DVD before. So this is the first time it's been off the VHS format. And uh, a lot of people are really excited when they announced this. Uh, it looks really cool like the cover. But uh, it's from 1984. This is Demon Wind. And look at that. Look at that. Demon coming through the window. It's pretty cool. Uh, I'll give you a close-up uh, in a second. Uh, they say it's like a combination of like, Evil Dead meets like some Lucio Fulci films, which sounds fucking awesome. Like, this has got to be great, right? Uh, so this guy's grandparents have died some horrible death, and he's going to him try to go to this isolated region where they were when it happened. He takes some friends with him, and uh, they're trying to figure out the mystery behind his grandparents' death. Kind of a weird reason to go do anything. Uh, but, yeah, so there's apparently this force there called the Demon Wind, and it turns them into monsters. Or something. <laughs> Sounds pretty crazy and ridiculous at the same time. Uh, it's directed by Charles Philip Moore, who I'm not really familiar with. I might have seen something he made and just didn't know it. Uh, stars Eric Larson, who sounds familiar... Francine Le Pense, Sherry Lee, and Stephen Quadros. And uh, it's a newly, newly scanned and restored from 2K from the 35mm original camera negative. Uh, it's got an interview with the producer, Cindy Horowitz, interview with actress Sherry Lee, interview with cinematographer Thomas Calloway, audio interview with the editor Christopher Roth, uh, it's got trailer, still gallery, and you get the... Uh, Special cover if you are one of the first 3,000. It's limited to 3,000. It's kind of like a bigger release. A lot of times they limit some of these to 1,000 copies. But uh, I guess since this is uh, assumed to have been the more popular title, they they uh, did a bigger release for this slip cover. But uh, it looks pretty cool. Everybody seems to like it. From from what I've heard, uh, I, although I did hear some person say that it wasn't nearly as good as they remembered it being, <laughs> so maybe a uh, time hasn't been so kind to this one. But uh, you know, it's my first time seeing it. Maybe I'll like it. Let's open it up. All right, here's a close up of the slipcover. All right, there's the demon coming through the window, and there he just burst out of it, shattered the glass. That's pretty awesome. They did a real good job on that. Uh. There's the back of the slip cover. There's your synopsis there and your extras here. So just take a pause and uh, read what you need to. It's all region. 1984. About an hour and a half long. Uh, it's got the DVD and the Blu-ray. So I, I you know, advertise this. This is like never but released on somewhere over here. It says, yeah, never released on DVD. Comes to Blu-ray. But there is a DVD in here, apparently. So, I guess it's doubled up on here. Yep, it's two disc. So, now it's on DVD and Blu-ray. But I don't think you can just get the DVD. I think you have to buy, like, the pair for that price. Which isn't a bad gig, you know. You're getting two versions of the film. Or two copies. So if you got a friend. So you got both versions of that. That's pretty cool. I'm ready to watch it. I don't know about you guys. Let's pop it in. Whoa! So this was a bad movie. But it was a great experience. It was it was it's so conflicting. It was like I was smiling the whole time I watched this, but I was also like criticizing the shit out of it. I was like, this is fucking stupid. Why are they doing this? What's going on? You know, <laughs> uh, it, it's one of those type of movies, kind of like uh, like Troll Two or something. You know, it's just so bad. It's good. 
it, it's enjoyable as hell. Like, I loved watching it. I uh, want to watch it again, actually. There's no commentary track on here, so uh, I was hoping for that. Like, a nice rerun through with a commentary, but uh, no dice here. Uh, so you have Corey, and uh, at the beginning of the movie, his grandparents are in this, like, remote little house on a, on a hill. It's like big, you know, wide open plains and, uh, you know, there's some trees in the background, but, uh, it, it's mostly like an open area. There's like a barn and, the, you know, there's a house and the grandmother is and the, and the grandfather are like panicking in the house and, uh, they're, they seem like they're getting chased by something or whatever. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the grandfather becomes, like, possessed or something. And, and there's, like, a battle between the two. And, and, and then the house blows to smithereens. It's just totally demolished. And so, I'm not sure how much later this is. But the grandson and his girlfriend are, like, driving out to this place. To this remote area where the grandparents were living. And he's going to independently investigate what happened here. Uh, it's been, it's been a, a little while at least because, you know, they had to, have, had to put them in the ground and have noticed that they were dead, you know, it had to have been a w little while before he decides to go out there. So whatever evidence, uh, if this was a standard case, whatever evidence there would have been of their demise would be long gone, I'm sure by now. Uh, expect, especially the nature of the death, it was like a big explosion, you know, like everything was freaking gone uh so he he's going with his uh girlfriend they're kind of chatting and apparently he had went and saw his father and uh she's kind of asking about that and it kind of goes to some flashbacks of him seeing his father his father's all cooped out and he's like you know a crazy drunk and he's got like some kind of ritual candles in his in his house and all kind of shit like that and uh he's just like not very happy with the experience that he had seen his dad in that state. Uh, I guess they were like estranged or something like that. But uh, anyways, they just keep moving and they finally get to this like cafe type area that seemed totally abandoned. They go in there meeting all of his friends there. He, he He's trying to investigate the death of his grandparents that have been dead for who knows how long. And he's going to invite all of his friends that, you know, you know the, the, obviously it seems like they've uh, been separated and they kind of get together every now and then. Uh, so, yeah, what a great time to get together and have a reunion. I'm going to like, investigate the death of my grandparents in the middle of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> so it's already stupid as hell. Uh, they get to the cafe and, you know, him and his girlfriend are kind of looking around trying to find somebody. And since it seems abandoned, you know, like the girl just pulls her pants down in the middle of the cafe and, you know, shows her. She's got like these see-through underwear on with a big heart on it. And she's like showing off her ass to him, and he's just—he said something ridiculous. He said like a moon for the misbegotten or some shit like that. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Uh, but he was like dead serious, a moon for the misbegotten <laughs> over her hot ass and that little, you know, sexy lingerie underwear she had on. Uh, except that heart looked really dumb. It was like oh, it was like seriously like a heart like this big, like on one butt cheek. Uh, but then the friends start coming in. You got like the jock guy. You got kind of like a nerdy guy with a rat tail. Yeah, this, this dude has a rat tail on his, on his head. Uh, if anybody remembers those, if anybody young enough to remember rat tails, this guy had one. Uh, 1984. I didn't even realize that was a thing in 84. Because I think I went to high school or to elementary school in like the early 90s with like kids who had rat tails. But uh, I, guess it, I guess it lasted longer than a decade. Uh... But yeah, the, the friends come in, they're kind of like, try to give him some personality. Uh, the, and, you know, it's like his friends and then they all have like the girlfriends with him. I guess they're all kind of like a tight knit like group of like, probably friends since high school type of thing. Uh, and then all of a sudden like, the best character come, shows up and he's like this magician guy. And he's got like, you know, at first I thought they were like a gay couple, like Siegfried and Roy, but... Uh, the main magician dude seemed to have at one time had a relationship with the jock's girlfriend and he's too self-centered and she ran off with the jock because he cares about her. Uh, 
they they vaguely <laughs> elaborate on that situation. It, it really means nothing. Uh, but it's just something they threw in there later on. But uh, yeah, he shows up with his driver. So I'm not sure if the driver is like his assistant from for his mag magic show, or if he's like another one of their high school friends, and they he the the two of them just paired off and became like an act. But anyway, he's got a guy driving him in this convertible, and he's like in his like magician outfit, like you know doing this big pose, you know coming up the hill, and uh, he starts doing like little tricks and stuff, and uh, the jock hates his guts. Uh, throws like a beer can at him, and then the dude starts doing all this crazy like kung fu, uh, you know, kicking the can up in the air like four or five times before he like spin kicks it into the jock's face. Uh, he's a great character. He, he's he's funny. Uh, I mean, he's a kung fu uh, kung fu magician. I mean, <laughs> and uh, he's gonna fight zombies later. So. They go, they all, they, you know, they all rendezvous at this cafe and then they go out to the rubble that is the house that's left. And it's basically, there's nothing there. It's just like pieces of a wall and there's like a doorway on one of the sides of the wall and nothing on the other side, you know, because it's all been blown to bits. But when they go through the doorway, it's almost like the house is still intact and they're just walking through rooms and stuff that aren't. You know, they're visible from the outside, but it's, you know, once they get through the doorway, it's like it all becomes visible. Uh, and that doesn't seem to strike them as odd uh, at first. And then there's like some shit written on the wall that one of these girls reads out loud. It's like in Latin. And then as soon as she reads it, like everything in the, it starts shaking and exploding inside the house. So they run out. And apparently what had happened is when she read these, this sort of incantation that was written on the wall, it unleashed the demon wind and, and now this whole area uh, this whole zone is kind of like their playground uh, the demons playground and uh, it, this is where it starts to get really fucking weird uh, the the laws and the nature of these these demons isn't very uh, elaborated on like uh, it's sort of like they can just appear and disappear when they want they uh, can possess people. Uh, yeah, it's just, they're not very clear about it. And then, like, these, like, little girls, like, normal-looking little girls, like, pop up and uh, while they're trying to get away. Yeah, I think this is their first encounter, actually, uh, after the shaking in the house. They, they try to run to their car and get out of there. And, like, these little girls, like, appear, and they grab the hand of one of the women that are there and say something to them, and then she turns into, like, a little baby doll like a little porcelain type baby doll and with blood all over its mouth. And then her boyfriend sitting there is just like, huh? You know, and then, then that's the end of it. He's not like his girlfriend just turned into a baby doll right in front of his eyes. And he's like not reacting at all. They're, they're sort of just like, Oh, well let's run back in the house. And so they go in the house uh, the cars won't start, start anyway, so, uh, yeah, they, they're hiding in the house, and, uh, they realize that they're sort of in danger, and, uh, so while they're sitting there, he, uh, like, everybody falls asleep, and the magician duo are there talking, they look out the window, and they see this bare-breasted, beautiful woman, who, of course, is a demon, and they acknowledge that they know she's a demon, and they try to wake everyone up, and everybody just ignores them. And so they're like, well, let's go out there and take them out. So they got, you know, they each have a gun and they just go out there, have the most uh, uneventful action scene with guns. Uh, you know, it starts with like, this is just a woman that's out there. And then all of a sudden it's like a horde of like zombie people show up. And uh, yeah, so it just goes crazy from there. Uh, they, they, People in the house wake up. They realize they're being attacked by zombies. Uh, for some reason, the zombies just don't come in the house because initially they don't have the house boarded up. They're just hanging out in there. But then later on, they board up the house and they're like, we're going to keep them out. And the zombies are trying to get in. Uh, why didn't they get in when they had a chance? <laughs> if they could just appear from nowhere. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's like certain areas where the guns won't work because they say this is the... Uh, the house of the damned or I, I don't know like there's crazy shit there's just weird shit that happens in the movie uh the makeup for the demons or is uh 
it's it's not great, but it, it is. I guess it's effective because it looks really gross. They're all slimy and their teeth are all you know jagged and fucked up. It's not like a pristine looking design. It's, it's a very sloppy looking design. They're just a like a melted milk dud or something. And I could I could see why they would compare it to like Evil Dead or, or a Lucio Fulci film because it has kind of has like the same. You know, it's like in a sort of has that cabin in the woods type of. A vibe to it like Evil Dead with in you know like demonic entities like that can possess people and stuff but then you also have like like the demons are zombies in a way it's like you know their friends are get killed or something and then all of a sudden they'll come back to life but they're like demon possessed uh, but it's yeah they move like zombies they're slow uh, which doesn't make sense like you think you know they if it's a demon inhabiting the body they can just you know, have all these powers and stuff, but uh, that's not the case. They kind of just roam around like zombies real slow and even have their arms out sometimes. Uh, but they can talk. So, like, you know, their friends might die and then they come back as weirdos and then they, they're, like, talking to them and stuff and, you know, cracking sort of jokes and stuff and shit like that. Uh, but, yeah, it, it definitely has, like, you know, because, like, uh, what is City of the Living Dead, you know, like, the, 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 uh, the physics and the... Uh, natural laws of, of of that type of uh i guess they were like zombies and that sort of but they, you know like instead of living dead the zombies would just like be able to teleport randomly uh but then sometimes they would just like hang it like they had the priest that was just like hanging from the noose and he was just he didn't really do anything he would just show up somewhere hanging and uh you know some of the zombies would walk and and do stuff but uh, yeah i don't know it's it almost like they just said the hell with it. Like, we want to do this scene. We got an idea for this scene. Does it make sense? Who cares? Uh, that's that seems to be like what they do with a lot of this film. Uh, there's yeah, there's like a lot of like uh, almost interdimensional jumping, I guess. Like where the the main character kind of goes to like alternate realities or like in a dream state or something like that uh, while he's combating the big bad villain of the movie. Uh, but it, it's so funny, like the acting is so bad that these, you know, it seems like there's a lot on the line here. The stakes are high, people are dying, but nobody seems to give a shit. <laughs> like people die and then they just, they, there's, like, there's no grief, there's no uh, reaction to it. It's just, okay, uh, let's run over here now. You know, that that's part of why this movie is bad, is because of the acting and, and, the, and the way they deliver some of the scenes and, and you know there's no reactions to anything uh that's going on and just the, the setup itself is dumb you know inviting all your friends out here for this shit nobody blames him really uh for bringing them out there uh, i don't know it's weird but it, it's totally enjoyable it's funny uh i don't know if it's intentionally funny but it's funny uh i would definitely I would, in addition to comparing it to evil dead and uh like a fulci film like zombie or city of the living dead i would also compare it to troll 2 uh just you know it's super low budget uh the producer interview he talks about how insanely low the budget was he won't give you a number he says you're not supposed to talk about it but he said it is an insanely low budget for a film like this and he praised the director i also apologize for being an asshole but he praised the director for doing such a fine job with such, you know, with so little to work with. Uh, he says this was part of uh, three movies that he was working on, too. Uh, one of them I have is Twisted Nightmare Code Red released that one. I haven't watched it yet, so it'll be on this channel eventually. Uh, but the Demon Wind, they did uh, Twisted Nightmare, and I can't remember the third one. Uh, it's one that I don't have. Uh... But he said he didn't have as tight a relationship to this film because he didn't he, he wasn't working directly with this one. He just kind of like uh, producing it. I think I think he had to do, had to cover like some editing or, or certain parts of the other two movies he was more hands on with than this one. Uh, but he was he seemed legitimately surprised that it was even getting another release. He thought it was just like a dead and buried film that nobody gave a shit about. And then here they are, Vinegar Syndrome with, with this fancy cover and everything and all these extras on here uh let's see that yeah that was producer sandy horowitz uh interview with actress sherry lee she didn't have a really big part in this but she's probably one of the more recognizable faces i know i've seen her in some other films uh she, i don't think she really ever has like huge parts in films but she gets around uh but yeah she she's uh she's actually the one that turns into the uh baby doll she's the first victim 
of this of this thing that happens uh and it's kind of just weird <laughs> like i still don't understand what that was all about and she actually comes back later in the film and, and for another situation and she might have even been uh one of the one of the demon zombie people that i just didn't recognize well the gunk on her face uh but yeah she didn't have a huge part while while still being human uh and then there's the interview with the cinematographer, and uh, he seemed like a pleasant guy. He, he had like a, a nice character about him, and uh, just talked about how hard it was to do some of these shots. Like they'd come in one day and they'd shoot the scene, and then they'd have to rush people over to make up to come back to be the demon characters. And uh, talked about what a huge pain in the ass a lot of this was, especially since they had no money and uh, having to do all these effects and stuff like that. And uh, I, I, I will say, for uh, if, if the budget is as low as they say it was, this, this is an impressive feat. This is, this is a a good movie uh, overall for to be a low budget film. It's you know it's enjoyable. Might not make any damn sense, but it's definitely enjoyable. And you know there's a story there. It just it's just really sloppy. <laughs> uh, and then there's the audio interview with the editor, Christopher Roth, and, uh, yeah, it's about 20 minutes. All these interviews are about, you know, 15, 20 minutes long. And, you know, he, he just kind of goes on about how tough it was to edit the film and how he just had to lock himself away by himself and, you know, assemble a movie that didn't seem to have any hope of coming together. Uh, so it was an interesting interview, uh. Wish it would have had a visual because it's hard, kind of hard for me to pay attention to audio interviews. Just sitting there looking at a still image on a screen and listening to some guy talk. But uh, yeah, it was okay for what it was. Uh, that's about it though for the for the extras. That's about it for the film. So uh, if if you're into the just like if you're into like stuff like Evil Dead, definitely check it out. Uh, Fulci fans, I don't know if I could recommend it to them unless you like a little something to laugh at, you know. Uh, Fulci's films were a little bit more serious, uh, but this is, I, th I actually do believe this was intended to be a serious film, and they just mucked it up so bad that it turned into a comedy. Uh, that's how it, that's how it feels to me anyway, but, uh, so if, yeah, if you're into, like, schlocky, weird, odd shit, if you're into Troll 2, check it out. Uh, definitely worth watching. Uh, it's definitely, like, one of those party movies where you sit there and just have a few drinks and laugh your ass off to it. But uh, this is Demon Wind, so hit that like button if you like the video, hit subscribe if you want to see more. I'll see you guys later.